A couple weeks ago, I learned something new and I wanted to share that with you. I actually learned this by having a discussion and a little bit of a debate with other Unity developers where I was saying something and they were saying something completely different and I was wrong. And this happens all the time, right? You've got to remember that as a developer, you're going to learn new things, you're going to be wrong about things, and you've got to be open to that. And you really should be open to learning new things constantly. For me, this was a reminder and kind of got me motivated. So I sent out an email to my list and asked for them to just send me things that I might not know, teach me something new. So today I'm going to go over the thing that I learned and then a couple of the really cool tips and ideas that people sent in. Now, if you watch through this and you have an idea for something else that you think I should have covered or you think everybody should know or that I should know, drop a comment down below and let me know. Also, if you don't mind, please hit the like button and subscribe and share. It really helps and I really appreciate it. All right, let's get started with the first thing. What was that one thing that I learned about? Well, it's actually just down to this single line of code. And this is it. This is that single line of code that led to a big debate in an entire YouTube video. This serialized list of game objects or a list of prefabs using a serialized field attribute. And we we're discussing and debating whether or not this would show up in the inspector. Now, I was arguing against it, saying you definitely can't serialize a list of game objects. That'll never work. You have to use an array. So let's see if I was right. Jump over to Unity and... You can see right here in my gem spawner, apparently you can serialize lists. And this got added a long time ago. I just got stuck with it in my head that you had to use an array all the time because that's how it was when you started. And it just never really picked up and never clicked for me. And the next thing that I wanna talk about kind of follows along that same vein, although this one I did know about and I was following really closely, but a lot of people don't know exists. And that's the C Sharp 7 functionality in Unity. Now I could blab on about what that means and how cool it is. In fact, I tried that and cut that out. Instead, I'm just going to go and show you exactly what these features are and what they mean really quick in just a couple of seconds. So here's a gem spawner class, and we're going to start with expression body properties and methods. What are those and what do they mean? Well, let's take a look at this property right here. I have an update method checking to see if something is ready to spawn. And here I have a simple property with a getter that returns whether or not the current time is greater than or equal to my next spawn time. But this is a lot of extra noise and code for this one little line check here to see whether or not this time is met. What we can do is convert this to an expression body property though. Hit Alt Enter and to expression body property in Rider, or you can just type out the change on your own. And you can see the converted syntax is quite a bit shorter and I think quite a bit easier to read. Now we just check to see if the time is greater than the time and we're going to return this value. We're going to return whatever is after the little lambda operator here. So what does that look like for a method, an expression body method versus an expression body property? Well, let's change this choose random prefab into an expression body method. Here I'll go hit alt enter. Got to go maybe onto the name of it and then hit Alt Enter and then choose Expression Body Property. And then you'll see that it looks exactly the same except that we have the parentheses. So if you want to have parentheses and you want to generally, if you want to pass in parameters to something or you want to do an action, then you might you go with an Expression Body method over a property. I'd say it just depends on which uh, scenario you're in. If it would normally be a property, go with Expression Body Property. If it would normally be a method, go with an Expression Body method. Let's go on to the next C-sharp 7 feature though, and that's the null conditional operator. This question mark dot. What is this doing and why is it here? Let's zoom in a bit. Here I've got a text object that's defined as a TMP text, which is a text mesh pro text object. This is the base class for it so that I can use it for world space and screen space objects. And on this line, I have a question mark before my call to set text. And now normally set text would just set the text of this object. But this question mark here is saying, hey, first check to see if this thing is null. If it's null, then don't do it. Rider does give me a little bit of a warning here though in this underlined little yellow line. And it's saying that this null conditional operator doesn't actually check the life cycle of this object. So if the text object has been destroyed, it's, it was there and then it got destroyed, we might get a failure here and throw an exception, a null reference exception. But if it was never assigned, we're totally fine. And if it's not a game object, we're totally fine to use the null conditioning operator too. I use it all the time. I wouldn't worry too much about the lifetime check unless it's an object that you're actually destroying. If it's something that you're creating and destroying at runtime, then do a full null check. Let's go on to the next part though. There's more to this line here and that's this dollar sign and the quotes with the variable in here. This is the string interpolation feature. If you add a dollar sign before quotation marks, you can put any variable inside of here 
just by putting in the little braces and saying something like next spawn time, adding in the closing brace, and it'll put in your variables right into your text and makes it nice and easy to read. Next, I wanna talk about something that a lot of people know a little bit about, but probably not quite enough about. And I got a couple recommendations on this one, and this is coroutines. The first part about coroutines that people don't generally know is that you can start them off in your start method. You can actually make your start method an IE numerator, and then just do a yield return in there, and it will actually kick it off as a coroutine and wait. You can see here I've set up a simple little delay that waits for one second and writes a message without having to start up a coroutine or add an extra code. Now let's talk about keeping a coroutine reference. I have this coroutine right here on line six, private coroutine coroutine. Why do I have that and what would I use it for? Well, we can actually manage the life cycle of our coroutines by keeping a reference to them. And here I've got a wait a minute method and an update method. Let's take a look at how this would work and how we would use it. So I've got my update method set up so that I can hit the alpha one key or just one on my keyboard. And it will first check to see if this coroutine is not null. So if I've assigned something to this coroutine, I can stop it by calling stop coroutine and just passing in the reference to the coroutine. Now you might wonder where do I get the reference? So it's on this next line right here, line 31. When we start a coroutine, we can get back a reference to that and cache it in a variable. Then I can use it in my stop method to kill it whenever I want. So here on one, I stop the routine and then restart it and wait a minute. And here, if I hit number two, I just stop my coroutine. It's important to note though that if I don't stop it here and I just start another one, I will lose the reference to the first one, but it won't stop. It's not going to kill itself just because I started another coroutine. So I want to make sure to manage these things intelligently when I'm managing them, but it's important to know that we can and it's a pretty powerful thing to do. Let's see what that looks like in the editor real quick. So I hit play and then there's my delayed message. And if I hit one, I should see my messages start. And let's uncheck collapse and I'll hit one again. And you'll see that my messages restart down there at the bottom and it should start scrolling. And if I hit two, my messages completely stop. So there you go, cool coroutine functionality. Next, we'll hit some hotkeys that most people don't know about and have saved me a lot of time. The first one is just for controlling where my camera is. See how my camera matches with my game view right now? If I wanna move my camera over to here and get a better view, I can go get my scene view in position with that right mouse button and WASD, but then go select my camera and hit Control Shift F. This will move the object to match the scene view's rotation and position. This doesn't just work on cameras. I can move another object, like go grab this cube right here and move down here and hit Control Shift F and you can see it moved and matched my orientation. I, most of the time though, I just use this for cameras. What do I use for moving objects around? Well, there are a couple other things. First, let's move this player around with Control Shift. Watch what that does it snaps him down to whatever object I put him on. So he's kind of snapping to ground. Remember that's just control shift and you'll get that little box and drag around. Another really cool one is vertex snapping. I'm gonna select this cube right here, this little one, and then hit V. Now when I hit V, notice that I get a box here, I get a box in each of these corners and just one in the center there. These boxes are actually for the vertices of my object. Because it's a cube, there aren't very many, but let me grab this bottom vertex and I'm gonna snap it to this top vertex of this other one. So I'll hold V, click, drag, and snap it up there, and now it's aligned perfectly. I don't have to do the math, I don't have to figure out the values or anything, it just snaps the vertexes together. The last hotkey I wanna share solves a problem that I see a lot of people struggle with, and that's that they hit play and their scene view goes away. The game view pops up to the front. Now you could just drag your game view out, make it a separate tab or put it on another monitor. But if you don't have that option, you can also hit shift and space over the scene view to maximize it. Then when you hit play, it won't switch over to that game view and it'll leave your scene view up so you can see things. Now I'm gonna show you a really cool trick for debugging UIs that don't work. Here I've got a button that I can't click on. When I click on button one, button two gets clicked on. If I click over here, it works, but in the middle, it's broken. Oh, there we go, broke it again. So how would I debug this? Before I would have gone around writing some extra logs or trying to figure out what object is selected or doing some weird stuff in code maybe, there's actually a very simple solution for this. If we select the event system in our scene hierarchy, we'll get a little debug view here in our inspector. Now this might be collapsed. If it is, just click on that little thing right there and it'll pop right up. And what you want to look at is the pointer enter. Watch what happens as I enter things. Here I've entered a button and you can see, oh, what? that says something about a bad image, that's interesting. But here, if I click on it, everything's okay. And here, when I click, the button is fine. And here it says the last pointer enter was that text. But if I go to the middle, I am getting that bad image again. 
now I can expand it out and realize, oh, hey, look, I actually have this image here. Let's see where that is. If I hit scene view and go to my bad image and then hit T to hit my transform tool or my rect transform tool, I can see that this actually overlays into here. Now the event system debugger shows you a lot of other stuff like what things you clicked on, how much your mouse moved and everything else. So I highly recommend that you get familiar with it and just get used to the idea of checking it whenever you have an issue with your event system. There's one more really cool thing in the game view that I wanted to show though. And this is something that's super simple, but helps a ton. And that's this mute audio button. If you've ever been overwhelmed with extreme noise, you're playing your game and constant just power ups or coins getting picked up, or you just get tired of hearing the same background music over and over and over, mute audio button will turn everything off. But while we're on to mute audio, a lot of people know about this one. A lot of people don't know that Unity actually has an entire audio mixer system built right in. If you go to window and mixers, you can set up an entire mixer, create a mixer, create channels, adjust the levels and the sound effects of all of those things. It's cool to play with and definitely something worth checking out. The last tip I wanna show is something that I think applies to all of us and it's something that I use on a really regular basis and that's the debug view of the inspector. If you have your inspector window selected, you can click on the three dots and go to debug and suddenly your custom inspectors will disappear. Your sprite renderer might look like a mess like that, but you'll also see a bunch of other new fields like my total spawn that's a private field on this gem spawner and my next spawn time. I wouldn't normally be able to see those and I'd have to write out some sort of a log or make a public version of them. The debug view gives me quick insight into what's going on there and lets me well, really just debug things without having to write any extra code. Now, what if you don't wanna keep switching back and forth between normal and debug? One cool thing that you can do is open up a debug inspector and then hit add tab and just add another inspector and have a debug and a regular inspector side by side or that I can tab back and forth between. I had a ton of submissions when I sent out a request for ideas. So I wanted to at least thank everybody who replied and gave me good ideas. I couldn't fit them all into this video, but I plan on doing quite a few more. And I also wanted to say thanks in advance to anybody who's put a comment down below with ideas or suggestions or tips or things that you think that other people just don't know. And if you got one, feel free to just put it down there now. Now's a good time for it. Also, again, special thanks to everybody on Patreon. Really appreciate you. And um, yeah, please share, like, thumbs up, all that stuff. Thanks again. Have fun coding. Bye.